Traversing the halls of museums, you're able to see the remnants of animals that used to walk this earth, with walls of bones that today serve as an important reminder of a world that once was. But there are no starker reminders than photos. Photos that give us a glimpse into a world that seems eerily similar to ours, yet so much different. Most extinctions happen silently, in a whimper that no one can hear or is listening to. And while it may be too late, these whimpers can still be heard in the final images of animals that are no longer on this earth today. These moments, captured for eternity, give us a time to appreciate the animals who are once taken for granted and the chance to look into the future to try and stop these photos from ever being taken again. Here are three stories of extinct animals and their last sightings. A little over a hundred years ago, a passenger pigeon sat alone in her cage. Martha, as she was known to the public, was an aging 29-year-old bird. She had lived at the Cincinnati Zoo for nearly half of her life, and for the last several years, she had done so by herself. Martha wasn't just any other bird. She had no hope of her own babies, no hope of finding a friend or of finding a mate. Attempts had been made for years with no avail. Every other pigeon was dead, and Martha, well, she was the last of her species. What makes this especially heartbreaking is learning that the passenger pigeon was once the most social bird group to ever exist, and now the only things that were keeping Martha company were her handlers. Yet less than a hundred years before this, passenger pigeons were the most abundant bird in North America, numbering in the billions, inhabiting various habitats with the most important regions being around the Great Lakes, where they would use this area to gather annually for mating. These birds were identifiable by their grayish blue head, back, and wings, and a reddish pink underbelly. They had bright red eyes and a long pointed tail. But what made the passenger pigeon instantly recognizable was their highly social behavior. These birds form massive flocks numbering in the tens to hundreds of millions. To grasp the enormity of their numbers, early settlers recorded their experiences. In the 1820s, French naturalist John James Adubon recorded seeing a flock of pigeons that spanned one mile across and 240 miles long, taking over 14 hours to pass overhead. Other observers expressed similar awe when recounting these remarkable sights. Many noted how these massive flocks often would blot out the sun for hours on end, or how they would congregate on trees in such immense numbers that branches buckled and broke under their weight. Such sights were not uncommon during the colonial period, but even still, a hundred years after John James Adubon's description, the last wild passenger pigeon would be shot, killed, and stuffed in 1900 and Martha, the last of her species, crowded around by spectators, wondering how such a feat was accomplished, would die on September 1st, 1914, marking the end of this once extremely successful species. How did a bird who numbered in the billions die out in just a hundred years? The massive flocks that these birds used to be so successful were almost immediately used against them, being taken advantage of by early colonists and settlers of North America. Because they nested in large colonies and had flocks that were so dense, hunters could just aim up, pull the trigger, and kill dozens or even hundreds with a single shot. This overhunting met its high point in the 1850s, when meat production of the pigeon became highly commercialized. At this point, 50,000 birds a day were being killed. Commercial hunters used a variety of methods to catch the pigeons, including nets, traps, and even dynamite. The birds were then shipped to cities and sold as cheap meat. The final large flock of passenger pigeons persisted until 1896. Sickeningly, it was publicized and advertised as so, intentionally drawing sportsmen who gathered to kill them. The entire group of birds were exterminated in a single day. It's only been a hundred years since the last passenger pigeon died, but for our next animal, the baiji, also known as the Chinese river dolphin, things would be a lot more recent. This animal lived in the largest river in Eurasia, the Yangtze, for millions of years, making them one of only six species of river dolphins in the world at the time. These dolphins held a special place in Chinese culture, becoming integral to its mythology. Considered as good omens, they are believed to appear to sailors or fishermen in peril, guiding them safely to shore. Their graceful nature and revered status earned them the nickname of the Goddess of the Yangtze. Enhancing their mystique, the Baiji were exceptionally difficult to spot due to their habitat in the murky waters of the river. To navigate these challenging conditions, the Baiji, like other dolphin species, developed highly advanced echolocation abilities. This adaptation resulted in their distinctive foreheads, which appear slightly bulbous, and house the melon, a crucial organ for their much-needed echolocation. They were also relatively small, with the largest individuals reaching only about 7 feet in length. 
They also had long, thin snouts that aided them in hunting fish. These adaptations contributed to the widespread success of the Baiji. In fact, their success was so remarkable that over the 20 million years of separation from other dolphins, they had actually evolved an entirely new mammalian family known as the Lepotidae, and they would continue flourishing up until about the 1950s. At that point, their population of about 6,000 would rapidly decline. This would eventually accumulate into a 2006 research expedition when a team of surveyors in search for the last Baijis used microphones to try and pick up the clicks of the dolphin's echolocation. Sadly, despite surveying nearly 2,000 miles of river, no clicks were heard, leaving only a deafening silence of a species lost forever. The last confirmed sighting was a 25-year-old Baiji named Chichi, who passed away at the Wuhan Institute of Hydrobiology in 2002 marking not the end of just an entire species, but also an entire family of mammals. So how did this dolphin, who were around for millions of years and numbered in the thousands in the 1950s, see such a disastrous decline? Well, there was a combination of many factors, with one of the most devastating influences being entanglement in fishing gear. It's thought that half of the observed deaths of the Baiji in the 1970s and 80s were caused directly by this. The evidence of how painful and common these traps were is visible even today, in the many photographs of individuals with cuts and scars all over their bodies. In addition, hooks were often found in the stomachs of dead individuals, or they would be found trapped in gill nets or flight nets, where they would inevitably drown. Another fishing method that had devastating effects on the Baiji was electric fishing, which had been reported seeing electrocuting Baijis on multiple occasions, killing them instantly. Apart from fishing, as China began to industrialize, more and more boats began to use the Yangtze River, so the dolphins who had to go up to the surface for air would be struck by the propellers of these boats with increasing regularity. Adding to this, much of the river began to be separated by dams, and massive amounts of wastewater and industrial sewage would be pumped into the river. Every year, it's estimated that about 16 billion cubic meters of wastewater would be put into the river. That's enough wastewater to fill up 1.5 million football stadiums. These actions brought the Baiji's numbers from around 5,000 in the 50s to only 300 in 1980. It was at this time conservation efforts began, laws were put into place to stop their deliberate killings, and attempts to make safe breeding areas for the dolphins were initiated. These attempts were too little, too late, and would inevitably fail, making the Baiji the first dolphin whose extinction was directly caused by humans. However, no story exemplifies too little too late more than that of the thylacine, also known as the Tasmanian tiger, who in 1936, only 59 days before the last known member of its species would die, would finally be granted protection under the law. Imagine that you're deep in the hearts of Tasmania. The wind is blowing in off the coast, and the plane stretches out miles before you to a barely visible mountain range. Suddenly, you spot some movement among the low swells and hills of the plain. An animal steps into view, something you've never seen before. You peer closer and notice it has a head like a dog, but a long, low body with stripes on its hindquarters like a tiger. It even has a long, thick tail like a kangaroo. What on earth is it? These are the exact thoughts of French explorers who arrived on the island of Tasmania in the late 1700s. These observations would eventually make it into the minds and ears of British settlers in 1803, who initially arrived on the island with doubts of finding this large carnivorous marsupial. However, as time passed, they too began to observe signs that would prove these stories true. When the settlers began to build their colony, the Tasmania tiger was already nearing its last chapter. With a population numbering at about 5,000, they were already extremely hard to spot. However, this wasn't always the case. Before their populations were limited to Tasmania, they could be found stretching across the continent of Australia and as far north as New Guinea. Evidence of this has been found in a variety of locations, such as the 5,000-year-old mummified thylacine found in an Australian cave, or the numerous depictions of the animal in ancient Aboriginal cave art. Nevertheless, Scientists believe that combined with overhunting by humans and competition with the newly introduced dingo, that ultimately they would meet their demise on the mainland about 3,000 years ago. The species' last hope was in Tasmania, where there were only small populations of humans and no dingoes. This island would become the last refuge for the last marsupial megafauna. However, this refuge wouldn't last forever. With the establishment of the first colonies in Tasmania, the British quickly took to reshaping the island. As the farming industry took hold, 
Vast swaths of land were cleared to cultivate livestock. The Thylacine's habitat was rapidly shrinking, and conflicts between the farmers and the Thylacines soon arose. The farmers whose livelihoods depended on their livestock quickly came to believe that it was more than just the land that needed to be cleared. Their sheep and chickens were being killed, and the blame was put squarely on the head of the Thylacine. The population's perception of the animal plummeted. To the Tasmanian people, their tiger was nothing more than a nuisance, a threat to their livelihoods, and something that needed to be eradicated. In response, the first bounty systems for the Thylacine were established. In 1988, the Tasmanian government also introduced a bounty, offering one pound per full-grown adult and 10 shillings per juvenile destroyed. The program extended until 1909 and resulted in awarding more than 2,100 bounties. Over the Thylacine's long existence, the species had always found a way to live on. Even as all the other marsupial megafauna died out, somehow they still found a way. But the effects of their targeted eradication at the hands of us humans would be insurmountable. By the early 1900s, sightings of wild thylacines became increasingly rare. By then, the only reliable place to see one was at the zoo. It was at these zoos where the only reliable footage of these animals were captured, showing us just how unique they truly were. Looking at these videos gives me a profound sense of sadness. Watching this animal walk its cage, stretching, or yawning, makes it feel like they're just right there. Almost like you could put your hands out and touch it. Sadly, that is no longer the case. You would imagine that being the last member of your species might mean that you're treated with more care. But for the last Tasmanian tiger, who was on exhibit at the Hobart Zoo in 1936, they would be treated just as uncaringly as the rest of its species. Dying after being locked out of its enclosure and freezing to death during a cold Tasmanian winter. But what makes the eradication of the Thylacine so much more depressing is the fact that even after wiping them out, for some reason the number of livestock being killed didn't slow down. It proved that the large majority of these killings were actually being caused by wild dogs who were brought to the island by the settlers. All these stories exemplify human negligence at the largest scale. Hopefully today, we could tell these stories of the past and see these images of these final animals to remember not to make the same mistakes. Though we may be improving, even now it is a hard to fight the tides of human ignorance. We still see our own last videos, last photos, and last stories being written with animals like the northern white rhino or the Gobi bear. And with that, as always, thank you for watching. Jehona out.